This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a man asking for information about language classes over the phone. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, Globetrotters Language School. How may I help you? Yes, I was wondering if you could give me some information on language classes. Certainly. What language are you interested in studying? Well, that's the thing. I'm interested in learning Japanese, but I'd also like to improve my Chinese. I don't know which to study right now. Maybe the class schedule will help you decide. Did you want to study in the morning, afternoon or evening? I work in the evenings, so mornings or afternoons would be best. Then that decides it for you. We offer an advanced Chinese class, but it meets on Wednesday and Friday evenings. I couldn't do that. When do the Japanese classes meet? We have beginning Japanese on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. No, wait, that's intermediate Japanese. Which level do you want? Advanced? Uh, no, beginning, definitely. I know some Chinese and some French, but I'm a real beginner with Japanese. Well, then, are you free Monday, Wednesday and Friday mornings? That's when the beginning Japanese classes meet. We also have intermediate French on Friday mornings. I could do those mornings, but I'd prefer afternoon. Don't you have anything in the afternoon? We have intermediate Japanese class on Wednesday and Friday afternoons. I really need a beginner class, so I'll take the morning Japanese class. Could you give me an idea of the cost? What would be the tuition for the Japanese class? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10 Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. The beginning level classes meet three times a week, so they cost a bit more than the other levels. For a six-week course, the cost would be $575. That's a bit steep. If it's hard for you to pay that much, you could sign up for just four weeks of class and pay $410, 
or you could pay for one week at a time at $125 a week. That comes out to be much more expensive once you add up all the weeks. That's true. You can save money by registering for two levels together. For example, pay for your beginning and intermediate classes now and you'll get 12 weeks of class for just $1,050. That's not a bad deal, but I can't come up with that much money at once. I'll just pay for the six-week course. Fine. That class begins next week, so you need to register right away. Can't I register over the phone? No, I'm sorry. We don't take phone registrations. What you'll need to do is visit the school office today or tomorrow. Bring a cheque for the tuition and a photo ID. Is that all? Yes, we'll give you a registration form to complete, or you can save time by visiting our website and downloading the form there. Complete it and bring it into the office with your cheque. Great. I'll stop by this afternoon. Fine. When you arrive, ask for Mr Lindsay. He's in charge of student registration. I'm sorry, Mr. Who? Mr. Lindsay, spelled L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Thank you for your help. Thank you. We we'll look forward to seeing you in class. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You are going to hear a tutor talking to a group of philosophy students. First, look at questions 11 to 13. For these questions, complete the blank spaces in the table as you listen to the first part of the talk. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr Russell, and I am your tutor for philosophy this year. I think we're all here. Let's see... Five, six, seven, yes, that's everyone. Before we look at the three lectures you've had on philosophy this week, I would just like to run through a few things about what you can expect of me as tutor and what in turn we expect of you. As for myself, my function as tutor is to help you in all things relating to your work in the philosophy course. The help that I am able to give is, of course, mainly academic. For personal matters, I can refer you to other support services in the university, ranging from counselling to um, welfare. One thing that I would point out is that if you feel that you need to talk to someone, no matter how insignificant it is, don't leave it. Oh, and the last thing is, if you do need to make an appointment, the times are listed on the door of my room. You just write your name in a time slot. Uh, but I would point out that the appointment slots get booked up quite quickly. If it's urgent, catching me between sessions is the best idea. That way we can sort something out quickly. Um, no questions? Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20.
As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 14 to 19, circle the correct letter A, B, or C. OK. As regards you as students, the tutorials are voluntary. You're not obliged to attend, but you are encouraged to do so. Last year, for the first time, a register was kept of students attending lectures, and this year tutors are being asked to keep a register of tutorial attendance. This is not a formal register, and not all tutors will be doing it, but in the philosophy department, all of us have chosen to keep registers. Another point that's being emphasised this year is punctuality. When we did exit questionnaires, we found that people arriving late for tutorials and lectures was the single most annoying thing for the majority of students. Mm. I would therefore ask you to try to be on time for the tutorials, mm. and for all your other classes for that matter. Mm -hmm. As regards the tutorials themselves, we will have a review of the philosophy lectures of the week before, with the discussion being led by one of you each week. There is, of course, some planning involved, but you should rely primarily on the notes you made at the lectures. This will not take up the whole of the 90 minutes allocated to the tutorial. For the rest of the time, we will look at a particular philosopher, period or concept for which you will be expected to do some preparation each week. This will range from reading about a particular individual or concept to preparing a brief outline on a subject of your choice. How much you put into this depends on you, but we're not expecting in-depth analysis at this stage. Um, are there any questions so far? I'd just like to ask whether the work we do in the tutorials counts towards our continuous assessment, and if so, how much? I was just coming on to that point. All the work you do in the way of essays and project work that is graded counts towards your continuous assessment grades. The mini presentations and lecture discussions will not be graded, but obviously, as time goes on, these activities will, I hope, have an impact on your work and hence your scores. Does that answer your question? Basically, yes. But what about... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between Sally and Ben. They are new college students. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Now, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Ben. Sally. How are you? Fine. I wondered if I'd run into you. When did you get here? I only arrived last night, just in time. 
I prefer to travel on Sundays to miss the working rush. I suppose you arrived in plenty of time. Oh, I've been here for four days now, so it must have been Thursday that I arrived. I like to have a good chance to look around and settle in. I should have come earlier too. I'm hoping to get a part time job. Well, you've no time today, I suppose. Do you still plan to be an architect? Yes. It's what I've always wanted to do. And you were planning to do economics, weren't you? Yes, I was. But now I've decided on psychology instead. How many textbooks do you have to get? I've been given this long list and I'm sure they'll cost a fortune. See? That looks a lot. It's longer than my list. Well, it's fourteen, all told. So I might use library copies instead of buying some of them. What about you? I'll probably buy the whole lot of mine because I only have five on my list. Although I'm sure there are many more I'll have to read. Luckily, we don't have to read them all straight away. Have you got your class timetable yet? It came with the book list. When do your lectures start? Tuesday. That's tomorrow. How about yours? Oh, I've got an extra day, the day after yours start. Now you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. As the conversation continues, they are talking about their new As the conversation continues, they are talking about their new college life. Listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. It's nothing like school, is it? Not so far, and the lectures will certainly be different. Do you have any special approach for keeping up with lectures and the amount we have to read? Well, I usually try to read every word in a book in case I miss something important. So I suppose I'll try to write down every word of the lecture if I can. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'd get cramp in my fingers and I wouldn't really hear what was being said. I usually skim a book when I read and underline key parts. So I guess I'll try to make notes on the main points of the lecture. Have you thought of using a cassette recorder? You mean to record the lecture? Yep. Then you could make really good notes. Is it allowed? I think so. It must be. Plenty of people seem to do it. It has to be better than trying to write every word as you listen. Anyway, what's your first lecture about? Oh, it's on the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution? Sounds boring to me. Not really. It made a big difference to everything, including architecture eventually. So what's your first lecture about? It's about what separates humans from other animals. OK. Look, I was on my way to the library to check out some of these books on my list. I have a tutorial paper to give in a couple of weeks. Oh, what's the topic? Well, I think our lecturer must have trouble thinking up topics. The topic is, why study architecture? I don't know. It could give you a chance to set out what you want to do. I guess so. Have you been given any tutorials to do yet? Yes. Mine is called 
needs for sleep. Sounds almost as interesting as mine. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning and welcome to this talk on Canada. Many people think of Canada as a land of ice and snow. They think of it as a young country with few inhabitants, a country of English-speaking white people. While some of this is true, it is also an inaccurate description of the country we call Canada. Canada lies in the northern half of the continent of North America. The most northern parts of Canada are sometimes called the land of the midnight sun, because at certain times of the year the sun never sets, and is still shining faintly at midnight. This northern part of Canada is cold, and mostly snow-covered all year round. Most of the people who live in this northern part of Canada are called Inuit or Dene. They were once called Eskimos. They are the original people of this land, and are part of what are called the First Nation. As we move to the more southern parts of Canada. The land changes, and so does the people. Moving from east to west in southern Canada, we travel from the Atlantic provinces of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. These small provinces with small populations border on the Atlantic Ocean. The land in these provinces is not very fertile, so fishing. Forestry and mining are the main industries, although in some small areas, agriculture is also important. If we travel west from the Atlantic provinces, we come to Central Canada, composed of the large provinces of Quebec and Ontario. Both provinces are rich in natural resources, have fertile land, and are the centers of industry for Canada's largest cities. Toronto and Montreal are found in these provinces. 
The province of Quebec is the centre of French language and culture in Canada. In fact, Montreal is the second largest French-speaking city in the world after Paris. Finally, in the far west of Canada, we come to the province of British Columbia. This province is separated from the prairies by the Rocky Mountains and is bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean. British Columbia is often called simply the West Coast. British Columbia is an attractive place for tourists because of its mild climate, spectacular mountains, sea coast, and beautiful forests. Agriculture, forestry, shipping, and fishing are major industries in British Columbia. The people of this land of Canada are as varied as its landscape. The original settlers, those we call the people of the First Nations, came from Asia by crossing the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. In their new environment, they developed many new languages and cultures. In the 16th century, the first Europeans arrived in eastern Canada. They came from Britain and France. By making treaties with the original inhabitants, they gradually established colonies in eastern and central Canada. After a war with France, Britain took over the French colonies in Quebec and eastern Canada. By the end of the 18th century, all of Canada was under British rule. From this time until the present century, most of the immigrants to Canada were British. Scottish and Irish. In this century, however, Canada has had an influence of settlers from all over the world. There are now hundreds of thousands of people. From